Skype and has been praying for me. I didn't get the flu. Um, it's a sinus infection, which I tend to get, which tends to get bad. It moves all the way down to my chest and stuff. <coughs> but, <coughs> you know, uh, during part of the time I got extra sleep. Um, just, if I look tired, I am tired. Um, but I'm doing better, got a shot, and um, some other medication that's supposed to do stuff. My nose is still running and I still cough, and it, the cough sounds pretty bad, but it's not a contagious thing, so. Because uh, I went to the doctor and he said, uh, Oh, I can look at you. I can tell what you got. It's the flu. And I said, nope, doc. So he went through all the stuff, you know, and nope, 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 nope. And I said, how about this? Do, do, do. And he said, that's not the flu. <coughs> <coughs> all right. What? Yeah. Yeah, I just had a flu shot a couple of weeks before that. That's what gave me the flu. Not really. I don't have the flu. <laughs> All right. So anyway, thank you everyone who, who prayed and, uh, and I'm sorry about missing last night. As most of you know, I wouldn't miss unless it's, I'm feeling pretty bad, which I'm feeling pretty bad right now. But I feel like <clears throat> maybe this would be the big turn. Okay, we're in uh, Genesis. <clears throat> chapter 12, and uh, oh, we're about to get into um, verse 10 through 16, and this relates to, uh, you remember up to this point, Abraham has left Haran, where his family was, and he has moved on to the promised land <clears throat> and he's made a couple of stops and at those stops he built altars. And at the same time the Lord spoke to him. And the Lord spoke to him not concerning that he was going to um, start a great religion by this man um, or even you know that he would do the things that we would expect God to say to us but his primary focus was on the place and the seed and the seed we have seen in Galatians chapter 3 16 which seed is Christ um, and Paul clearly defines this, this whole story in relationship to God's concern that the firstborn come forth and be acknowledged. I mentioned this early in one of the classes, but, you know, God knows, uh, well, let's start with Abraham. Abraham, or Abram at this point, his name hadn't been changed yet, Abram he has no clue who the seed is. He doesn't know the seed. He doesn't even, you know, he hasn't met him. He doesn't, but God knows the seed, especially if that seed is Christ. Then God knows the seed. The Father knows the seed. And uh, so much of our lives, we think, are taken up with God trying to protect us and help us and heal us and do all these things. And He's wonderful to do those things. I mean, he is. And yet, his heart, if he had his way in our hearts, it would be more than religious and it would be more than just our personal lives on this earth, but it would be to develop an eternal relationship with the Father through the Son. And so um, we have, um, I think, the last verse just before this said something like um, and he went on still going south to the Negev or to the south which is 
taken him right into Egypt. So let's begin Genesis 12, beginning with verse 10. And there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. <clears throat> All right, so let's, let's think back to him coming into the land. Okay? He comes out of Haran. He's finally left uh, the journey that started in the Ur of Chaldees, and God said, you know, go into the land, um, but uh, Terah, his father, and the other people that were with them stayed there and never went into the land. So God speaks to Abram, and he says, you know, go into the land that I will give you and that I will show you. And um, uh, you think about it because, I mean, he really did emphasize the land that I will show you because he's showing us something that is not ours. He's showing us that it's something that is his and is relating to him, particularly in relationship to the seed. So he goes, he comes out. And when he comes out, he goes in between Bethel and Ai, and he's there and he builds an altar. And he, he built in that little short amount of time, three altars. God appeared to him. I mean, God spoke to him when he was in Haran, but God appeared to him when he's getting in the place where God wants him. And, you know, there's a place where God wants every one of us. There is. There's a place. And he wants our heart to be there because there's so much religion and, and things that, uh, and I'm not, I'm not trying to put down Christianity. I'm not talking about Christianity. I'm talking about religion, but re Christianity can can be religious and not really have the heart of the Lord in its heart um, to know him, to grow in him, to grow in a relationship with something that's eternal and not just um, make our way in a life that is temporal. Um, so he gets to these places and he builds altars. And yet, um, and in those, God appears to him, and God speaks to him. And, um, uh, but then it has that little phrase, but, but he, he still continued going to the south. He's still going towards Egypt. Well, this explains why, okay? Because this is the next verse. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land, okay? So now I want you to recall, because we, we're on a journey. We've been talking about uh, this all started with the prodigal son. Then we talked about Egypt, and we saw that there is a pattern, a template that God, that if he shows it to you and you can see it, you can go to different places in the book in the word of God and lay it over there and you'll see the Lord. Even though the people are different, the circumstances are different, the template is very, very similar. And one of the things that you find in that template, which we've talked about several of the things on our journey uh, to find who are the firstborn and to have the firstborn um, come out of us unto the Father, one of those things is the famine. Famine. What does it mean? Okay. Well, of course, in the natural, it means that um, food is scarce and maybe water is scarce and, you know, resources are scarce. Um, and we look at it as uh, something that affects our agriculture or something that affects our bottom line, our dollar, um, because now we're having to work harder for less but God uses that famine because you know the prodigal son if you remember he went out with all kind of goods you remember that he had all kind of goods they weren't his they were the father's they were the inheritance that goes to the firstborn do y'all remember this but the prodigal said before the father had died because you don't get the inheritance until there's a death he says 
give me the goods that falleth to me. And he wants to have the inheritance without the death. Okay. Well, uh, there, there's a, now there's a, a picture of Christianity, though, not just religion. And that is, we want to get, er you know, I want everything God wants. I want everything from the, you know, this, if it's in the Bible, I want it. I want all the promises of God. <coughs> well, okay, well, one of those promises is famine. It's necessary. It's necessary. So he goes out with all this stuff, but he spends it all. And then when he gets in real trouble, what does God send to help him? A famine. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at, let's look at, we, were, we went through, you remember, we were in Exodus in the first bunch of chapters there, and what happened there, right? They go down into Egypt, um, the family of, um, we see that in Genesis, and we'll see that more when we start talking about Joseph, but they, they go down, they're in the land, this very land that Abraham just came into, the same land, the same situation, the same place exactly and there comes a famine in the land and they they go down to Egypt to get help and of course we know that Joseph was down there and they end up staying there but they go down there because of a famine right and now here's our third picture where again a famine has come up and they've gone down into Egypt and you're going to see this more than more and more <coughs> All right, so the famine. Notice that it was a, the famine was grievous. It was a grievous famine. The famine is meant to be grievous. It is meant to take away all your resources. It is meant to deprive you of your human abilities to, to do it on your own. It is God's, I mean, you look at the prodigal son. I mean, if you look at the father, you know, I mean, our Heavenly Father, his Father, <clears throat> he was sent out with all the blessings because he, he asked for them, and he asked inappropriately, and he asked out of touch with the Father's heart, but the Father gave it to him. But he, there is no way that he can handle the resources of God without making it about him. And so you end up prostituting the things that should be glorifying the Father. <coughs> Amen. <coughs> and so, so, so God does do something about it. God says, "Okay, you're pretty low right now, but you're not low enough." How low is low? Well, we know we we've every one of us at some time or another have gone through a humbling situation. And especially those of you who've, who've been in the Lord for many, many years, he puts you through humbling situations and you go, man, this is, okay, Lord, this is enough. I get it. You know what I mean? I, I, okay, I'm with you now. And then he goes, you know, you, and you say stuff like, man, and Lord, I've hit rock bottom. And he goes, you're not even halfway down yet, you know. I got a lot more for you. Why? Because... He's, he's trying to get you out of you. <clears throat> he's trying to get you off of the inheritance and on to the firstborn who it belongs to. But we're still praying, oh God, give me this, take care of me. You know, <clears throat> if, let's just say this. Uh, let me just, I'm going to make up something. I know this isn't probably the best example in the world. But if I was going down to, say, um, <clears throat> Cuba or something, still a communist country, no matter what <coughs> goes on. <coughs> Been down there many times. They can, they can take you and put you in prison, and we have no terms with Cuba, and they can leave you there until your, rot, your bones are left in there. So I, so I go down there, and I'm thrown in prison, and I say, oh, Lord, <coughs> get me out of here. Oh, Lord, help me. Or, or if I'm in the thing and... They're depriving me of food or whatever where I can't hardly subsist. And I say, oh, Lord, um, you know, give me some food. <clears throat> and then somehow the guard has compassion, brings the food. And, okay, and then eventually, oh, Lord, get me out of here. And he gets you out of there. 
if, if I'm in that cell, me, Randy Nussbaum, if I'm thrown in that cell <clears throat> and I pray, Lord, give me some food, and God himself gives me food, who also gets a benefit from that? My body. Right? And if I am taken out of there, my body goes with me. Well, we're the body of Christ. And we're always praying as if we're not one with Jesus. We're always praying as if we're separate. We're always praying as if we're not the body of Christ. We're, we're, you know, we're praying, oh, Lord, do this for me. And what if he hears your prayer, but he's not doing it for you? What if he's doing it in the name of Jesus? Another name, not yours. I mean, what if that's the case? I think it is, but I'm just what if I am you right now? <laughs> you know, what if that's the case? <clears throat> and so all of our focus is on ourselves, and all of our focus is on our needs. But it, but if the Lord, if the Father took care of the needs of His Son within us, the greatest treasure, then and the Scriptures declare Him to be that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Yeah. Well, who's he a treasure to more than us? The Father. <clears throat> and so, um, <clears throat> so if we're, uh, if we're just praying, you know, religious prayers, help me do stuff for me, and then he answers our prayers, <clears throat> we automatically assume that that's not, not only God answered my prayer, but I must be, kind of spiritual because he did something special for me you know and we're going to build our ego one way or the other on <clears throat> on these things instead of being built up in Christ doesn't the scripture say that we should be built up in Christ <clears throat> excuse me sorry so much and so uh, we we begin to realize uh, through the famine we begin to be brought to a place where we actually see I really am not the object of this thing. That he's not only not helping me, he's trying to bring me lower so that, remember the story of the prodigal son, lower so that eventually when I return to the father over my needs, he begins to reveal the son in me and he treats me like that son because it is that son in us, Christ crucified, the Lamb of God in us. So, um, <clears throat> so that's, a, you know, our focus. Our focus is too religious. It's not enough on the God of our religion, if you'll put it this way. It's not, you know, I've said this often, and, you know, I'm sure people hate me for it, but, you know, Jesus is not a Christian. never was he's just the son of god you know he didn't he doesn't read the bible he is the living word of god yes he read it when he's on this earth but he is the living word of god he doesn't uh he doesn't pray to god he talks to his father are you are you kind of following this you know well, that's who we're joined to. That's the relationship we're supposed to have. Instead of going, oh, Lord, da 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 da, we're supposed to say, Father, in the name of your Son that's within me and in the name of your Son that's in this body, we ask you to do this. Because we always say, well, and we'll give you all the glory. We don't always say, but I mean, you know, a lot of times when you pray, we end with, you know, may all the glory go to you. Well, yeah, because. <laughs> It is his glory. <coughs> and it is, <coughs> it is the one that he has birthed. The new birth in you is Christ, just like it was with Mary, the mother of Jesus. That birth was Christ. <coughs> you, you are um, uh, converted. You are filled with another life and you're on you are in covenant with God based on the covenant of oh my 
See, this makes me want to go into 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and just show you the vast difference between the two covenants and the thing that makes one covenant what it is and the thing that makes the other covenant what it is. But, but I've already done that many times over the years, so I'm not going to do it tonight. <clears throat> but my heart is there. So this, this famine that the prodigal is experiencing <clears throat> is reducing him down. <clears throat> this famine that Israel experienced was kind of like, um, kind of like the same situation with the prodigal in that they came down and got all the goods from Joseph, remember? They got it all. But then when Joseph was gone, what happened? They became slaves. Okay. Well, Joseph was the firstborn. If the firstborn's not there, if the first not born is not the object, if the firstborn is not sitting on the throne, can I get an amen? then what's going to happen? We go into bondage. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. But by love, serve one another. See? And that means that that's his spirit. By love, serve one another. Stand fast in the liberty to serve and to bless and to pour out, because that's the nature of the firstborn. The nature of man as firstborn can be seen all the way through, Ishmael, what's his nature? Esau, what's his nature? Uh, um, the brothers against Joseph, what's their nature? It's always, I got to get, I got to have, that's mine. You don't, you know, I don't want you to have it. You make me jealous. Uh, um, Cain, you know. Every story we've touched has the same, the same marks of God the Father in relationship to his firstborn. And, the, and they're screaming this relationship <clears throat> all the way through and is the focus of the stories all the way through Genesis and then in Exodus and, and other places, probably in Micah. <laughs> probably, I don't know. <clears throat> Just guess. So, um, the prodigal probably went out with all of the goods that he said falleth to me when they didn't, they didn't belong to him. And he, <clears throat> he used them wrong, and then he ends up without <clears throat> anything. And God looks down and says, this is my opportunity. It's time for the famine the great work of God, the great move of God, because I'm going to send him into a far country. Well, I don't know. It didn't say north or south, but if it was south, that's Egypt. <laughs> <coughs> Amen? And what happens there? He ends up in a pig farm, in a pigsty, feeding pigs. And again, you know that Jews are not, they don't, they're not supposed to eat bacon and all that, not even supposed to be with unclean beasts. And God has him there. God brings that about. Because there he has to see, he has to see, it. it's not all on me. I'm not the great provider. I'm not the one who, who is the one who figures this all out. I need the Lord I'm, I see now that this, so picture the prodigal. I see now, I see now, I have no strength in this situation to turn it, to fix it, to get out of it, any of anything, no way. And you come to a realization, I had a way when I was in my father's house, but it wasn't me. It was him. Okay? So an awakening starts happening. An awakening starts happening in the famine that doesn't happen in another place. All right, so you've got, <clears throat> you've got uh, uh, 
Jacob and his sons in the promised land and Joseph's down in Egypt and he's gone through all the stuff he's gone through. Um, but he's come through it pretty good. He ends up being, what do they call it, king of Egypt? Pharaoh. And it was right next to Pharaoh. So he ends up, because he passed through all of those things in a right spirit, that's the firstborn in him. See, the spirit in which you do it is everything. It's not about being a perfect Christian. It's about giving the father his son perfectly. <laughs> and you, you know what I mean by that, though. You can, that's not you. That's not a demand on you. That's not a responsibility to you, except your responsibility is to get out of the way and acknowledge the son. It, it's not I but Christ. You ever heard that before? Galatians 2.20, not I, but Christ, okay? Well, you're still his body. You still, you know, you still have a mind. You still have a personality. He gave you that, but he wants to be the nature and the life by which you live. That's his heart's desire. The father wants his son. He doesn't want, you know, you can be, you can be good at what you do, and he probably is going to have to, take that away from you eventually so that he can show you himself or at least bring you down long enough to be in that place where it'll be effective. What do I mean by effective? Where there is a change and a transition that happens from your, your outlook, your way of viewing things to his, your idea of, well, I'm going to please God by doing this and this unto the fathers. You will please me by allowing my son to give himself through you. <clears throat> so the, the brothers that did all this to Joseph, the firstborn, rejected the firstborn. And in a certain sense, you could say that both the prodigal and the elder son rejected the firstborn. And so what happens? God sends another famine because the brothers need it now. The brothers need it. And so they come down in there, and now that we don't have anything, and we're destitute, and we're just asking you for some help, and... And uh, so they said, you know, they'd say something like this, and, and, and uh, Joseph would speak roughly to them. And you go, well, why would he do that? Well, he'd turn around and start bawling afterwards. He didn't want them to see because he's trying to get them to a place where they're going, oh, my God, if, if, he, doesn't, if he doesn't move, if he doesn't do this, we're in trouble. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> so that... The famine and the rough treatment at that moment isn't God hating you. It's God bringing you in. He's throwing the line out there and he's reeling you in. He's reeling you into what? More of his son. More of his son, less of you. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so we have this situation. We have Abraham. And God has just, just before he came into Egypt... God had poured out, opened, I mean, appeared to him and poured out his blessings. This is what I'm going to do, but it's about the firstborn. Y'all remember that? He, he's not just saying, I'm going to do this for you and you. Now he said, unto thy seed will I give all of this. Okay? But he's given all these promises. And then the very next thing that happens outwardly is he ends up down in Egypt in trouble. Where's the promises, Lord? Where's the help? Where's the, you know, who curses me shall be cursed, and who blesses me will be blessed. Well, <clears throat> it's still there, but remember last time we talked about the, the curses don't take away the blessings. You know, we think it's all over. We think it's one or the other. But you can be going through bad stuff, and still, the Lord is there. Amen? 
still the Lord is there. So we lean into the Lord. I, Paul said it. I have, I have learned. It didn't come easy, but I have learned that whatsoever state I find myself therein to be content. I've learned to be abased and I've learned to abound. You know, you have to learn to be abased, but you also have to learn to abound. Did you know that? <clears throat> because if God gives you, starts blessing you and opening doors and doing things for you and making sure that you're provided for and <clears throat> all that kind of stuff, um, if you don't handle that right, if you handle it like a king or controlling, you know what I'm saying, you know, like you control the whole thing, then, you know, God can easily remove that. But you also have to learn to be a base. You have to learn because things, you know, things, life is just that way. Sometimes you're up and sometimes you're down, you know. And, you know, I've, I've been in a lot of these pastors' meetings where they talk, you know, and they only talk about, my church is doing so good and my people are just really, you know, givers and all this. This is the way they talk. And uh, I'm sitting there. I remember the first time I was here and all that and I thought, you know, well, this group isn't that way. We have ups and then we have downs and then we have ups and, you know, we have, you know, we have every kind of situation you could imagine. And I thought, well, God just must have given me a bunch of renegades. no. No, they're just, it's just Adam. It's the nature of Adam, and it is in there, everybody, in every church, in every situation. But we want to look good to people. We want to look good. You know, well, we're doing this, and we're doing that. Well, you know, I mean, what if somebody really knew what the deal was? And you said, well, have you, have you ever tried, uh, you know, uh, a teen, teen group where you're teaching the teens? And they go, well. Well, that blew up in our face or something. You know, you start probing and you find that we all have the same ups and downs that at different times, but we have it so that we are being brought more and more in tune with the Lord. And so that in the, you know, it's like if, if we're low, can it be Christ? Can we handle, if, if something's going wrong and we've been shamed, can we handle that in Christ by the nature of the land? Can we handle that? Or are we going to uh, either work to hide that, camouflage that, or use our mouth to make it sound way better than what it really is? Amen? Um, or can we just say, you know, I blew it and, uh, you know, it's you know, thank God that I have the life of Christ. I don't really have anything else anyway. You know what I mean? Because that's the truth. You may just not know how deep that truth is. <laughs> but that's the truth. So, <clears throat> so Abraham has come down in there. And he's got to be wondering, Lord, you called me into the promised land. And there you promised me all this stuff. And now over here. It looks like it's not happening, and I'm all the way down in Egypt in a bad situation down here. And so what is the questions that arise? <clears throat> well, is this the right place, or did I make a wrong move, or did I, you know what I mean? Because he, remember he was between Bethel and Ai at one point, and then he went on straight. So it's always the questions, it's always the doubts, it's always the fears. Well, how about God is in control and he can use famine better than you can imagine. He can use getting you in a place where you're not in control and where you're not guiding everything so that he can be the life of, the, of your being, of your, of your family, of your, uh, your mind, of your attitudes. And, you know, because, okay, so we all know this stuff. So if something starts going bad, well, all right, so I get all wrapped up in the circumstance. Well, this, this ain't right. And that, or why is this happening, Lord? Or I thought you said da-da-da-da. Or I had an idea that it was going to be this. Well, maybe it is that right now, and you can't even see it. 
What if that's what he wants right now and that's going to bring you through? But if your mind is so set on your preconceived idea, then you're going to say God's a failure eventually. Well, he's not a failure. And these circumstances are not failures. All things. Right, Jeff? All, be all things. <laughs> all things work together for good to them that love God who are the called according to his purpose. So the famine, <clears throat> I, I will admit the famine is emergency. Um, uh, it's like an emergency is needed. The prodigal son left home asking for the inheritance without a death. The elder son is at home and he's serving by the law. The children of Israel that are living in the land are, are, are killing the firstborn and then living without him and then everything's going bad. Abraham comes out and he's, he's coming out of, the, or, or, uh, of uh, Haran and he's got it in his mind that Lot, because remember the first words it says is he came out and he brought Lot. He's got it in his mind. This is the firstborn and God's going to have to break that down. And it'll get broke down more in, in the next couple of chapters. But he has to slowly, because he can't do it too fast or we'll just fall apart forever. He has to take our toys away. And he has to take away all of what we thought, here's how it was going to go. We just have to say, I'm with you in whatever state I find myself. I'm with you. I want you in whatever state I find myself. You know, well, aren't you freaked out? I'm sure that, there, that there's an effect, but it's not as big as the effect of, look, I just want you in this situation, and I want to be able to give you your son in season and out. And, you know, Paul said, whether by life or by death, that Christ may be made manifest in my mortal flesh. You know, we're going, not death. You know, not, not these hard things, not things that I don't understand. And that's the problem. See, we don't understand. We don't understand. We look at the famines in the Bible or we look at the famines that come in our life and we, all we think is this is the worst time of my life unless God does something deep enough that we, we stay with him in it. And when, there's, when you're coming out on the other side, who was I sharing that with today? I'm just talking about, you know, the Lord is my shepherd and he leads you beside still waters. He leads you in green pastures. But there's going to be a time he has to lead you in the valley of the shadow of death. And the only thing that's going to keep you from totally freaking out is the Lord is with you and he's more than with you. He's in you. And if he's in you as your life, then the valley of the shadow of death is no different than the green pastures. For the Lord is with me. You see what I mean? You're, or is the green pastures your comfort, not the shepherd? Then the, the, green shep, the, the green pastures are my shepherd. The still waters are my shepherd. Because that's where you're drawing your peace and your comfort instead of Jesus or instead of Jesus in us, instead of his life, instead of going, you know, it's not the externals of life. It's this is something that is eternal and will always be. And I'm building on it and working toward it being that way now, not someday in the future when I die. So your heart begins to draw to the Lord and you're, you begin to separate. You separate, and this sounds so crazy, you separate from the problems unto him. Again, that means that you will have to eventually separate from the green pastures and the still waters too. Not that you don't have them, but that you are not, they don't bring you the comfort that he does. He, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not lack. Okay. Well, if you, if you don't know him as that, if you don't know him as that, 
what's going to happen is you're going to get in the valley of the shadow of death and you're going to fear evil. Because the Lord isn't your shepherd. For thou art with me. You, you know, even if he's with you, he's not, he's not, you're not with him. You're not with him. And if that withness hasn't taken place, then it's just, you know, he's, he's with me in terms of beside me instead of in me. But when you get in, the, in, in, then eventually you get in any situation, like Paul said, I have learned, took me a while, but I've learned in whatsoever state I find myself therein to be content. I've learned to be abased and I've learned to abound. What's the next verse say? I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. That's the next verse. When it's talking about I can do all things, it's not through Christ. It's, it's not talking about you can do brain surgery if somebody gets hit by a car or you can drive an 18-wheeler if you want to just try it and stuff like that. That's, that's stupid. That, uh, you know, and people are always quoting stuff like that. I can do all things. I could be an astronaut. No, no, I don't think you could. But anyway, um, so, but what is it? What is that verse referring to? And is it important that we know the context of these verses instead of just quoting one out of a whole nother meaning and throwing it out there and say, "Woo, let's all shout! We can do all things through Christ who strengthens me!" Yeah, and everybody goes, "Yeah, and that Jesus is Lord!" Yeah, you didn't know that. You know, they're acting like they didn't know it. Yeah! Instead of going, yes, he is. You know, <laughs> you know, you got to scream and everything. Well, I'm for screaming. I'm pretty wild, but I don't, I don't rely on emotion building to get my life going for Jesus. Hallelujah. All right, so... Verse 11, and it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarah, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Wait a minute. Hold up here. How old was Abraham when all this happened? And she must have been a fox then at 65. Excuse my Oak Cliff Texan there. <laughs> so, but I mean, you know, he's talking to his 65-year-old wife and going, uh, better watch out, babe. This guy's going to become, you know, this is the king of, what is it, Gesher or whatever, <clears throat> and that he's going to be, you know, he's going to have all these women in his harem and he's going to drop everything when he sees you. <laughs> Whoa. <clears throat> well, I don't know what Abraham was thinking. I really don't. I mean, I, oh, I wouldn't be thinking, um, tell him you're my sister. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, just tell him you're my sister. This will this will really make this thing work out right. Yeah, yeah, it's a little you know, certainly not the Texas way. It's like it's my wife, buddy, <laughs> and you need to back off, dude. I'm the king. I don't care. I'm the husband. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm the king of her, and you're not. Anyway, so. But I guess he probably feel like, and from what we read here, he probably felt like he would have been he killed, you know, that he was going to die. But I like that he says, behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. She, she probably stopped him right there. There's probably a pause right there, don't you think? Say, say what? Could you say that again? I'm not sure what you said. You know what I mean? <laughs> I need to hear that. You don't say that except we're getting these crises. <laughs> so let's repeat this one again, okay? <laughs> I 
<laughs> yeah, yes. And could you, could you um, say that to the king? At least you've got a sister that's fair to look upon. I don't know, this really caught me. I just thought, this is kind of, kind of a weird little deal. It's your sister, so I, I mean, okay, if I was the king, I would go, oh, okay. Yeah, this is a, this is a good deal. This is your sister. She is, this 65-year-old woman fair to look upon. <laughs> Three days from everywhere. <laughs> okay, so, verse 12, Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me. But they will save thee alive. Okay, well, clearly, he hadn't got the firstborn working in him <laughs> yet, you know. Because it's like, okay, you go up there, and I'm right behind you all the way. <laughs> you <know. laughs> Use your womanly wiles, and we'll be okay, okay? <laughs> and God's going, this is not the way to go, okay? You know, I can see God saying, you know what we're missing here? The firstborn. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I see good play. Sorry, I sometimes lapse into my native tongue. <clears throat> uh, I'm just wondering if I should stop because this is. Uh, Well, let me just read up to this because I haven't touched these notes and I think I'm just saying what they're saying. This first part is just a, a tie-in from the last class. In the three verses just prior to these above, God has spoken to Abraham and give, Abram and given him wonderful promises. Twice after this encounter, Abram has built altars. Part of the reason to bless and bring satisfaction to the Lord, part of the reason for the altars, and the altars were built based upon a faith. And this is important right here. <clears throat> this will not be fully known, not be fully, fully known until the very end. But this reality with these altars will come in an incredibly spiritual manner. Um, and that is that he, Abram built these altars, yes, to, to bring satisfaction to the Lord but also the altars were built based upon a faith that trusts that God can use adversity to bring about his purposes. All right, it's very shallow right now. It's not clear. It's not walked in. Some of you are in that place. You don't have this down. It's not your government yet, but you're hearing it. You're, you're wanting it. You're desiring it. Well, that's what's going on with Abraham, and he is in the early stages of altar faith. And he's in the early stages of appropriating this and, and finding how, because at this stage, you can build an altar and then go against it because you, you know it has significance, but you, it, you, you know what I'm saying. You know it has significance, but you're not there yet. It's not built into you. It's not part of your DNA. And so, <clears throat> so that's what we see happening here, and that's the reason for the failures that we're seeing. But it is still the truth that these altars were built upon a faith that trusts that God can use adversity to bring about his purposes. And he will see that on a small, very small level as he leaves Egypt. He will see the turnaround of all of this. Uh, but he will see that more and more as he progresses through. And it's... Uh, it's really a beautiful thing, and it is the basis of all the scriptures, like on much of the book of Galatians, where it talks about the faith of Abraham. It gives us the true meaning of what the spirit of the firstborn is. Okay. So, after arriving in Egypt, the first thoughts of Abraham's mind are to conceive a scheme. <coughs> All right, so we can see that he doesn't have it worked in him, amen? Well, we got to get out of this. You know, that's the, that's the thought. 
people. There's a situation, you know, it's, it's like if you're driving along and, and spiritually like your life is going along like this and then a, a crisis happens in the road ahead and you got to go, well, i got to find a way to get out of this because, you know, I don't want to be caught up in the crash or something like that. <clears throat> We're always working to avoid instead of working to hear from the Lord and to be with the Lord and to draw from the Lord and relate to the Lord and to relate to the Lord by his son and relate to the Lord by the spirit of his, of the lamb, the spirit of the crucified. We just, it's just like, you know, um, when I was, a, when I was a kid, I got to spend the summer with my sister who lived in New Orleans and still does. <clears throat> and I was down there through the summer and playing pinball was a big, big thing back then and pinball is basically you have these little paddles and little things on the side that make them go and it shoots out a ball <clears throat> and that ball goes tung, 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 and you're trying to get it to go into the best places you know where it'll ding 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 and then pop out and move on and da 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 and you're trying to keep it out of the other places well most of us are playing spiritual pinball that's how we're living our life we just, we hit something, we bounce off, and we shoot over here, and go, oh, you know, well, I hope I can get my flipper in there and get this thing around, and, you know. <clears throat> there's no, there's no uh, order of life. There's no order of spirit. There is just, this is the stuff, and, you know, what, what is it? You, you play the, the, the hand that you're dealt. Well, or you can ask for some more cards, you know what I mean? I'll take three. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm showing that I was a poker player in my BC days. Anyway, so you, you know, it's just random. Things are just random to us, but it, it doesn't have to be. They're not supposed to be. When we hit something and bounce off over here, we can have confidence that God did that and wherever we're heading, we can live Christ even if that doesn't seem like it's the best place. Because he's not trying to satisfy your flesh. He's not trying to you know, make everything feel so right and so good. He wants his son. And all those things are, you know, this, this, this pinball game, it all, if it's God's game, it is not random. It's all working toward good. But the good is what's in the next verse, that we might be conformed to the image of his son. And if that's not happening, then all things are not working together. Y'all know that, right? So, so after arriving in Egypt, I guess I need to quit. I'll just finish this. After arriving in Egypt, the first thoughts of Abram's mind are to conceive a scheme whereby he may live in order to bring about the promises. So we're going to stop right there because the last thing you need to do is live that you could bring about the promises. Amen. <laughs> Isn't it good that we can see these things in someone else's life? but never in our own. <laughs> well, and that is the end game here. We are wanting this worked into our story. We are not just playing spiritual pinball or even natural pinball. Father, we thank you for your son and your spirit that is here to <clears throat> draw our hearts Draw our hearts, draw our hearts, and from our heart may our minds be drawn to the things that you care about and the things that will mean thing mean something. And Father, I read I read some of the genealogies and it just says, and so and so lived and then died, and or, or so and so lived, begot, and then so and so and then died, and then their son lived and then begot someone and then they died and then there's on and on and on but then you come along David and Abraham and different people in the Bible and there's this engagement with you in your life they're they're fully there and father the the Bible is full of those people and it has little to say about 
billions of lives that never found you in that way, never. They might have even gotten saved, but they just got saved and they never engaged you in the way that you want to be engaged. And it, and it just, it just, there's no story to be written in, in your journals. There's no story to be written. But Father, we ask you to please draw us out unto you more and more. Please draw us out unto you and make it real and make it not religious and make it not just going through the motions and make us make make that satisfaction that should be coming into our hearts when we're proceeding with you that should there should be joy in in what we're doing even in the worst of times deep down there's joy that we're still with you in the worst of times we love you and father we thank you and we thank you for your spirit continue to release the crack and release the Holy Spirit upon us, Father, and let him do the work that he needs to do. We ask you to do it, not in our name, because it's not about us, but it's about your firstborn. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen.